Welcome to Chapter 34, Pediatric Emergencies. After students complete this chapter and the related coursework, they will understand the anatomy and physiology of a child as compared to an adult. They will learn the appropriate assessment and care for the types of illnesses and injury affecting children of all ages, injury patterns based on size, and special body system injuries. They will also learn the indicators of abuse and neglect and the medical and legal responsibilities of an EMT. Introduction. Children differ anatomically, physically, and emotionally from adults. The illnesses and injuries that children sustain and the responses to them vary based on age and developmental level. It is important to remember that children are not small adults. Depending on his or her age, the child may not be able to tell you what is wrong. Fear of EMS providers and pain can make the child difficult to assess. Parents or primary caregivers may be stressed, frightened, or behaving irrationally. For these reasons, pediatrics, the specialized medical practice devoted to the care of young patients, can be challenging. Once you learn how to approach children of different ages and what to expect while caring for them, you will find that treating children also offers some very special rewards. Their innocence and openness can be appealing. Children often respond to treatment much more rapidly than adults do. Communication with patients and the family. Caring for an infant or child means that you must care for the patients or caregivers as well. Family members or caregivers often need emotional support. A calm parent usually results in a ch calm child. The parent can often assist with the child's care. An agitated parent means the child will act in the same way, which may make the child's care more difficult. Remain calm, efficient, and professional and sensitive. Growth and development. Many physical and emotional changes occur during childhood. Childhood extends from birth until age 18. The thoughts and behaviors of children as a whole are often grouped into five stages. Infancy, first year of life, toddler, ages one to three, preschool age children, ages three to six years, school age children, six to 12 years, adolescence, 13 to 18 years old. The infant. Infancy is usually defined as the first year of life. The first month after birth is called the neonatal or newborn period, zero to two months. Infants less than two months spend most of their time sleeping or eating. They respond mainly to physical stimuli such as light, warmth, hunger, and sound. Infants sleep up to 16 hours a day between feeding times and caregiver interactions. Infants should be aroused easily from a sleeping state. Infants cannot tell the difference between parents and strangers. Crying is one of the main modes of expression. Their basic needs consist of food, warmth, and comfort. Soothing includes holding, cuddling, or, or rocking. Hearing is well developed at birth. Calm, reassuring talk is helpful in soothing. An inconsolable infant, after all obvious needs have been addressed, can be a sign of significant illness. Having a sucking reflex for feeding, Head control is limited, also predisposed to hypothermia. It is often necessary to unbundle the infant during your assessment. Two to six months. Infants at this stage are more active, makes them easier to evaluate. They spend more time awake, smile, and make eye contact, and recognize caregivers will often have a strong suckling reflex, active extremity movement, and a vigorous cry. May follow objects with their eyes. Have increased awareness of surroundings and will use both hands to examine objects. About 70% of infants will sleep through the night by six months. Will begin to roll over at this stage. Persistent crying, irritability, or lack of eye contact can be an indicator of serious illness depressed mental status, or delay in development. Six to 12 months. During this stage, infants begin to babble, but their first year, they say their first word. Learn to sit without support, begin to crawl, and finally begin to walk. Predisposes this age group to an increased exposure to physical danger. 
Infants in this group also begin teething and explore their world by putting objects in their mouths, higher risk for choking and poisoning, may cry if separated from their parents or caregivers, called separation anxiety, assess while keeping the caregiver close by, persistent crying or irritability can be a symptom of serious illness. Assessment. Begin assessment by observing the infant from a distance. Let the caregiver continue to hold baby during physical assessment. We'll avoid separation anxiety and make the assessment easier. Provide as much sensory comfort as possible. Warm your hands in the end of the stethoscope. Do any painful procedures at the end of the assessment process. Complete each procedure effectively and avoid interruptions. Explain each procedure to the parent or caregiver before you perform it because the procedure and the infant's reaction may be up unsettling. The toddler. After infancy until three years of age, a child is called a toddler. Toddlers experience rapid changes in growth and the development. 12 to 18 months. Toddlers begin to walk, explore during this period. They are able to open doors, drawers, boxes, and bottles. Because they are explorers by nature and not afraid, injuries in this age group increase. Toddlers begin to imitate the behaviors of older children and parents. Known major body parts, when you point to them, may speak four to six words. Because of the lack of molars, they, do not, they may not be able to fully chew their food, leading to increased risk of choking. 18 to 24 months. The mind of the toddler develops rapidly. Vocabulary will increase from 10 to 15 words to about 100 words. They will be able to name a common object that you point to. Toddlers begin to understand cause and effect. Balance and gait improve rapidly at this stage. Running and climbing skills develop. Toddlers at this stage tend to cling to their parents or caregivers and often have an object that comforts them. Use any comforting objects when available to help calm the toddler. Assessment. May have stranger anxiety. May resist separation from the caregiver. Allow them to hold any special object for comfort. Demonstrate the assessment on a doll or stuffed animal first if possible. May limit the toddler's anxiety and make the assessment easier to perform. May be unhappy about being restrained or held for procedures. Toddlers can have a hard time describing or localizing pain. Use visual clues or Wong Bonker Faces ping scale. They may be distracted by a toy. Begin your assessment at the feet or away from the location of pain, if possible. Persistent crying or irritability can be a symptom of serious illness or injury. Previous medical experiences may lead to hesitation towards you. Preschool-aged children ages 3 to 6 years old. Able to use simple language effectively, the most rapid increase in language occurs during this stage. Children can walk and run well being and being throwing, catching, kicking during play. Toilet training is mastered at this, this stage. Have a rich imagination and can be fearful about pain. May believe injury is a result of earlier bad behavior. Learn which behaviors are appropriate and which behaviors will lead to a timeout. Tantrums may occur. Foreign body aspiration airway obstruction continues to be a high risk. Assessment can understand directions and be specific in describing painful areas. Despite increased ability to communicate, much of the history must still be obtained from caregivers. Communicate simply and directly. Appealing to the child's imagination may facilitate the explanation process. Do not lie to a patient of this age. Hard to regain lost trust. Patient may be easily distracted by games or toys or conversation. Begin the assessment at the feet and move toward the head. Use adhesive bandages to cover the site of injection or other small wound. Modesty is developing, so keep the child covered as much as possible. School age years, 6 to 12. Children at this age are beginning to act more like adults. They can think in concrete terms. They can respond sensibly to questions 
they can help take care of themselves. School is important at this stage and concerns about popularity and peer pressure begin. Children with chronic illnesses or disabilities can become self-conscious about fitting in. At this stage, children begin to understand death is final, but their understanding of what death is and why it occurs is still unrealistic. May increase anxiety about illness and injury. Assessment. Assessment begins to be more like an adult assessment. To help gain trust, talk to the child, not just the caregiver. The child is properly, probably familiar with the process of a physical exam. May or na may not make the assessment easier depending on the child's experiences. Start with the head and work toward the feet, as in an adult assessment. If possible, give the child choices. For example, would you like to sit up or lie down? Would you like to take your clothes off yourself? Ask only the type of questions that let you control the answer. For example, would you like this cuff to hug your right or left arm? Do not bargain or debate with the patient. Allow the child to listen to his or her own heartbeat through the stethoscope. These children can understand the difference between physical and emotional pain. Give them simple expl explanations about what is causing their pain and what will be done about it. Ask the patient, parents, or caregiver's advice about which distraction will work best. Adolescence, 13 to 18 years. Most adolescents are able to think abstractly and can participate in discussion making. Personal morals begin to develop, are able to discriminate between what is right and wrong, are able to incorporate their own values and beliefs into their daily decision making process. Physically similar to adults, but they are still children on the emotional level. Gradually shift from relying on family to relying on friends for psychiatric support, social development, and acceptance from their peers. Interest, interest in romantic relations begin. This is the stage when puberty begins. Makes the adolescent very concerned about body image and appearance. Illnesses or injuries can be over or under expressed due to feelings about body image or fear of disfigurement. May dislike being observed during procedures and have strong feelings about privacy. Adolescence is a time of experimentation and risk-taking behaviors. Adolescents often feel indestructible. They struggle with independence, loss of control, body image, sexuality, and peer pressure. They have may have have mood swings or depression or when ill injured may act younger than their age. Assessment. Adolescents can often understand very complex concepts and treatment options, providing them with information when they request it. Allow adolescents to be involved in their own care. Provide choices while leading guidance. An EMT of the same gender should perform the physical examination if possible to lessen the stress of the event. Allow the adolescent to speak openly and ask questions. Risk-taking behaviors are common at this age. Some risk can ultimately facilitate development and judgment and shape their identity as an adult. Risk can also result in unintentional trauma, drug or alcohol abuse, unprotected sex, and teen pregnancy. Female patients may be pregnant. Important to report this information to the receiving facility. Adolescent may not want parents to know this information. Try to interview the adolescent without the caregiver present if you suspect she is withholding information. Adolescents have a clear understanding of purpose and meaning of pain. Explain necessary procedures in advance. Assess level of pain by observing facial and body expressions as well as by asking. To distract them, find out some of their interests and get them talking. Anatomy and physiology. The body is growing and changing rapidly during childhood. You must understand the physical differences between children and adults and alter your patient care accordingly. The respiratory system. Anatomy of the pediatric airway differs from adults. P. 
pediatric airway is smaller in diameter and shorter in length. Lungs are smaller. Heart is higher in the child's chest. Glottic opening is higher and positioned more anteriorly, and the neck appears to be non-existent. As children develop, the neck gets proportionally longer as the vocal cords and epiglottis achieve atomically correct adult position. Occipic is larger and rounder, which requires more careful positioning of the airway. Tongue is larger relative to the size of the mouth and in more anterior location in the mouth. Child's tongue can easily block the airway. Long, floppy, U-shaped glottis, epiglottis in infants and toddlers is larger than adults. Rings of cartilage in the trachea are less developed and may easily collapse if the neck is flexed or hyperextended. The upper airway has a narrowing funnel shape compared to the cindular shape of the lower airway. The diameter of the trachea in infants is about the same as a drinking straw. Airway is easily obstructed by subscretions, blood, or swelling. Infants are nose breathers and may require suctioning of the airway and airway maintenance. A respiratory rate of 30 to 60 breaths per minute is normal for a newborn. A respiratory rate of 12 to 20 breaths per minute is normal for a teenager. Children have an oxygen demand twice that of an adult. The higher demand combined with a smaller oxygen reserve increases the risk of hypoxia. The muscles of the diaphragm dictate the amount of oxygen a child inspires. Anything that places pressure on the abdomen of a young child can block the movement of the diaphragm and cause respiratory compromise. Must use caution when applying straps of a spinal immobilization device because it may hinder the tidal volume. Gastric distension can interfere with movement of the diaphragm and lead to hypoventilation. Breast sounds are more easily heard because of the thinner chest walls. Less air is exchanged with each breath, so de detection of poor air movement or a complete absence of breath sounds may be more difficult. The circulatory system. Important to know the normal pulse ranges when evaluating children. An infant's heart can beat 160 times or more per minute. This is the primary method the body uses to compensate for decreased perfusion. Children are able to compensate for decreased perfusion by constricting the vessels in the skin. Blood flow to the extremities can be diminished. Signs of vasoconstriction include pallor, early sign, weak distal pulses and extremities, delayed capillary refill of cold hands or feet. The table on this slide lists the res responsive pediatric pulse rates. The nervous system. Compared to an adult nervous system, the pediatric nervous system is immature, underdeveloped, and not well protected. Head-to-body ratio of infants and young children is disproportionately larger, more prone to hen injuries from falls or motor vehicle crashes. Occipital region of the head is larger, which increases the momentum of the head during a fall. The synchnoid space is relatively smaller, leaving less cushion for the brain. The brain tissue and cerebral vasculature are fragile and prone to bleeding from shearing forces, such as during an instance of shaken baby syndrome. Pediatric brain also requires a higher amount of cerebral blood flow, oxygen, and glucose than does an adult brain tissue. This means that the pediatric brain is at risk for secondary brain damage from hypotension and hypoxic events. Spinal cord injuries are less common in pediatric patients. If the cervical spine is injured, it is more likely to be an injury to the ligaments because of a fall. For suspected neck injury, perform manual inline stabilization or follow local protocols. The gastrointestinal system. Abdominal muscles are less developed in pediatric patients. Less protection from trauma. Liver, spleen, and kidneys are proportionally larger and situate more anteriorly, so they are prone to bleeding and injury.
Because organs are positioned closer to each other, there is a higher risk for multiple organ injury caused by minimal direct impact. The muscular skeletal system. Open growth plates allow bones to grow during childhood. As a result of an open growth plates, children's bones are softer and more flexible, making them prone to stress fractures. Bone length discrepancies can occur if there is an injury to the growth plate. Important to immobilize extremities with sprains and strains because they may actually cause be stress fractures. The bones of an infant's head are flexible and soft. Soft spots are located in the front and back of the head, referred to as frontinelles. Will close at particular stage of development. Frontinelles of an infant can be useful assessment tool. Bulging frontinelles can indicate increase in cranial pressure. Sunken frontinelles can indicate dehydration. The thoracic cage in children is highly elastic and palatable because it is primarily composed of cartilaginous connective tissue. The ribs and vital organs are less protected by muscle and fat. The integumentary system, the integumentary system of pediatric population differs in many ways. The skin is thinner and less with less subcutaneous fat. Composition of the skin is thinner and tends to burn more deeply and easily than adults. Higher ratio of body surface area to body mass can lead to larger fluid and heat losses. Patient assessment, scene size up. Assessment begins at the time of initial dispatch. Prepare mentally for approaching and treating an infant or child. Plan for pediatric scene size up, pediatric equipment, and age appropriate physical assessment. If possible, collect age and gender of child, location of seeing, MOI or MOI, and chief complaint from dispatch. Teen safety. Ensure appropriate safety precautions and standard precautions have been taken. Note the position in which the patient is found. Look for possible safety threats to the child, pa parents, or caregivers, bystanders, or EMS providers. Patient may be a safety threat if they have an infectious disease. Next, do an environmental assessment. We'll give important information on the chief complaint, number of patients, MOI or NOI, and ongoing health risks. Inspect the physical environment and indications, interactions with caregivers and family. Information from parent or caregivers is important and may provide clues to the patient's problem. Document dangerous seeing conditions and inappropriate statements from caregivers. Traumatic scenes where chill, the child is unresponsive or too young to communicate. Assume the injury was significant enough to cause head or neck injuries. Perform cervical spine immobilization if you suspect the MOI to be severe. Remember to pad under the child's head and or shoulder to facilitate a neutral position for the airway management. Primary assessment. The objective of the primary assessment is to identify the treatment and treat immediate or potential threats to life. Pediatric Assessment Triangle, PAT or PAT. Use the Pediatric Assessment Triangle to determine if the patient is sick or not sick. The PAT is structured assessment tool that allows you to rapidly form a general impression without touching the patient. It can be performed in less than 30 seconds. PAT consists of three elements and requires no equipment. Appearance, muscle tone and mental status, work of breathing, and circulation to the skin. Appearance. Note the level of consciousness or interactiveness and muscle tone. You can also evaluate the pediatrics patient, patient's level of consciousness by using the AVPU scale, modified as necessary for the pa pediatric patient's age. An infant or child with a normal level of consciousness will act appropriately for his or her age, exhibiting good muscle tone and maintaining good eye contact. Poor muscle tone or poor eye contact can mean the, an abnormal level of consciousness. TICLS mnemonic can help determine if the patient is sick. Tone, interactiveness, consolability, look or gaze, speech or cry.
work of breathing. Increases as the body attempts to compensate for abnormalities in oxygenation and ventilation. Increased work of breathing often manifests as abnormal airway noise, accessory muscle use, reactions of the intercostal muscles or sternum, head bobbing, nasal flaring, tachypnea, increased respiratory rate, tripod position in older children. This position will maximize the effectiveness of the airway. Circulation to the skin. When cardiac output fails, the body shunts blood from areas of lesser need, such as the skin, to areas of greater need, such as the brain, heart, and kidneys. Pallor of the skin and mucosal membranes may be seen in compensated shock. May also be a sign of anemia or a hypoxia. Molting is another sign of poor perfusion. Cyanosis reflects a decreased level of oxygen in the blood. Is a late sign of respiratory failure or shock. Never wait for the development of cyanosis before administering oxygen. From the PAT findings, you will decide if the pediatric patient is stable or requires urgent care. If the patient is unstable, assess the ABCs, treat any life threats, and transport immediately. With obvious life-threatening external hemorrhage, assess and address the CABs first, including tourniquets for arterial hemorrhage for extremities. If the patient is stable, continue with the remainder of the patient assessment process. Perform necessary interventions and discuss transport, transport options with parents and caregivers. Hands-on ABCs. Next, you will perform a hands-on ABC assessment. Assess and treat any life threats you, as you identify them by following the ABCDE format. Airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. Airway. If the airway is open and patent, can and the and patent can adequately keep it open, assess respiratory adequacy. If the patient is unresponsive or has difficulty keeping the airway clear, ensure that it it is properly positioned and that it is clear of mucus, vomitus, blood, or foreign bodies. If the trauma has been ruled out, use the head tilt chin lift to open the airway. If trauma is suspected, use the jaw thrust maneuver to open the airway. Always position the airway in a neutral sniffing position. See skill drill 34-1. Keeps the trachea from kinking. Maintains proper alignment should you have to immobilize the spine. Establish whether the patient can maintain his or her own airway. Breathing. Look. Listen, feel technique. Place both hands on the patient's chest to feel the rise and fall of chest wall. Belly breathing in infants is considered adequate because of the soft, pliable bones in the chest and strong muscular diaphragm. Bradypnea, decreased in respiratory rate, is an ominous sign and indicates impending respiratory arrest. Circulation. You must determine if the patient has a pulse, is bleeding, or is in shock. Infants and children can tolerate only small amounts of blood loss before circulatory compromise occurs. In infants, palpate the bradial pulse or femoral pulse. In children older than one year, palpate the carotid pulse. Strong central pulses usually indicate that the child is not hypotensive. Weak or absent peripheral pulses indicate decreased perfusion. Absence of central pulses indicates the need for CPR. Tachycardia may be an early sign of hypoxia or shock, or a less serious condition such as fever, anxiety, pain, or excitement. Interpret the pulse within the context of the overall history. The PAT and primary assessment. A trend of an increasing or decreasing pulse rate may suggest worsening hypoxia or shock or Im improvement after treatment. When hypoxia or shock becomes critical, bradycardia occurs. Bradycardia in a pediatric patient often indicates impending circulopulmonary arrest. Feel the skin for temperature and moisture. Estimate the capillary refill time. Color should return within two seconds. Disability. Use the APU scale or the pediatric Glasgow Coma scale to access the level of consciousness.
Check the responses of pupils. A normal pupil constricts after a light stimulus. Pupillary responses may be abnormal in the presence of drugs, ongoing seizures, hypoxia, or brain injury. Look for a systematic movement of the extremities. Pain is present with most types of injuries. Inadequate treatment of pain has many adverse effects on the pediatric patient and the family. Assessment of pain may take into consideration the developmental age of the patient. The ability to recognize pain will improve as the patient becomes older. The wong Bonker faces scale is helpful in assessing level of pain. Exposure. The hands-on ABCs require that the caregiver remove part of the pediatric patient's clothing and allow observation of face, chest, wall, and skin. Be careful to avoid heat loss by covering the patient as soon as possible. The pediatric population is more prone to hypothermia events due to immature thermoregulatory system, thinner skin, and lack of subcutaneous fat. Infants younger than six months lack the ability to shiver in response to cold. Newborns and infants less than one month are most susceptible to hypothermia. Infants and young children should be kept warm during transport or when the patient is exposed to assess or reassess an injury. Cover the head. Up to 50% of heat loss can occur with a head that is larger in proportion to the rest of the body. Transport decision. Determine whether rapid transport to the hospital is indicated. If the pediatric patient is in stable condition, obtain a patient history, perform a secondary assessment at the scene, transport and provide additional treatment as needed. Rapid transport is indicated if any of the following conditions exist. A significant MOI with the addition of any fall from a height equal to or greater than the pediatric patient's height, especially with head first landing. Bicycle crash, a history of compatible with serious illness, a physical abnormality noted during the primary assessment, a potentially serious autonomic abnormality, significant pain, abnormal level of consciousness, AMS, and or any sign and symptoms of shock. Also consider the following when making a transport decision. The type of clinical problem, the affected expected benefits of ALS treatment in the field, local EMS system transport and transport protocols, your comfort level, transport time to the hospital. If the pediatric patient's condition is urgent, then in initiate immediate transport to the closest appropriate facility. Specialty facilities such as trauma centers or children's hospital have training staff and equipment to provide complete care for all levels of pediatric patients. The most appropriate facility is not always the closest. Ask yourself, can I deliver the pediatric patient to the most appropriate facility without risking or delay to the pediatric patient? If the answer is no, transport the pediatric patient to the closest facility. Pediatric patients weighing less than 40 pounds who do not require spinal mobilization should be transported in a car seat. A seat should be chosen to fit appropriate weight of the pediatric patient. To mount the car seat to the stretcher, place the head of the stretcher in the upright position. Place the seat so it is against the back of the stretcher. Secure one of the stretcher straps in the upper portion of the stretcher through the seatbelt positions in the car seat and strap it tightly to the stretcher. Repeat on the lower portion of the stretcher. Push the car seat into the stretcher tightly and retighten the straps. Follow the seat manufacturer instructions to secure a car seat to a captain's chair. Patients younger than two years must be transported in a rear-facing position because of lack of mature neck muscles. For pediatric patients who require spinal mobilization, the patient should be immobilized on a long board or other suitable spinal mobilization device. Pediatric patients in cardiopulmonary arrest should be on a device that can be secured to the stretcher. You should not use the pediatric patient's own car seat. The goal is to secure the, and protect the pediatric patient for transport in the ambulance. History taking. Your approach to history will depend on the age of the pediatric patient. Historical information for 
a toddler, infant, or preschool age child will have to be obtained from a parent or caregiver. While dealing with an adolescent, most information will be obtained from the patient. Sexual activity, possibility of pregnancy, drug or alcohol use should be obtained from the patient in private. Questioning the parents of a child about the imminent illness or injury should be based on the child's chief complaint. When interviewing the patient slash caregiver or older child about the chief complaint, obtain the following. NOI or MOI. How long the patient, pediatric patient has been sick or injured. The key events leading to the injury or illness. Presence of fever. Effects of the illness of injury on the pediatric patient's behavior. Pediatric patient's activity level. Recent eating, drinking, or urine output. Change in bowel or bladder habits, presence of vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, presence of rashes, obtain name and phone number of the caregiver if they are not able to come to the hospital with you. Sample history. Sample history for pediatric patients is the same as an adult. The process for attaining OPQRST is the same for children and adults. Questions should be based on the pediatric patient's age and developmental stage of life. Secondary assessment. Physical examinations. A secondary assessment of the entire body should be used when pediatric patients have, a, have the potential for hidden illnesses or injuries. Unresponsive or have a significant MOI. May help identify problems that were not as obvious during the primary assessment. But over time, the presenting signs and symptoms have become more apparent. Use the DCAP BTLS mnemonic, deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, and swelling. A focused assessment should be performed on pediatric patients without life-threatening illnesses or injuries. Focus your physical examination on the area or areas of the body affected by the illness or injury, as well as on the chief complaint. MOI or NOI, and the findings of the primary assessment. Infants and toddlers and preschool age children who do not have life-threatening illnesses or injuries should be assessed starting at the feet and ending with the head. school age children and adolescents can be assessed using the head-to-toe approach. Physical examinations may include the following. Head, the younger the patient, the larger the head is in proportion to the rest of the body. Look for bruising, swelling, and hematomas. Significant blood loss can occur between the skull and scalp of an infant. A tense or bulging fontanelle in an upright, non-crying infant suggests elevated intracranial pressure caused by meningitis, encephalitis, or intracranial bleeding. A sunken fontanelle suggests dehydration. Nose. Young infants are obligated obligate nose breathers, so nasal congestion with mucus can cause respiratory distress. Gentle bulb or catheter suction of the nostrils may bring relief. Ears. Look for drainage from the ear canals. Leaking blood suggests a skull fracture. Check for bruises behind the ears or battle signs. Late sign of a skull fracture. Presence of pus may indicate an ear infection or a perforation of the eardrum. Mouth. In a trauma patient, look for active bleeding or in loose teeth. Note smell of breath. Neck. Examine the area near the trachea for swelling or bruising. Note if the pediatric patient cannot move neck or has a high fever and this may indicate bacterial or viral meningitis. Chest. Examine the chest for penetrating injuries, lacerations, bruises, or rashes. If the patient is injured, feel the clavicles and every rib for tenderness and or deformity. Back. Inspect the back for lacerations, penetrating injuries, bruises, or rashes. Abdomen. Inspect the abdomen for distension. Gently palpate the abdomen and watch for guarding or tensing of the abdominal muscles which could suggest infection, obstruction, or intra-abdominal injury. Note any tenderness or masses. Look for any seatbelt abrasions or bruising. Extremities. Assess for symmetry. 
compare both sides for color, warmth, size of joints, swelling, and tenderness. Put each joint through a full range of motion while watching the eyes for signs of pain. Vital signs. Some of the guidelines used to assess adult circulatory status have important limitations in the pediatric patient. Normal heart rates vary from age in the pediatric patients. Blood pressure is usually not assessed in pediatric patients younger than three years, offers little information about the patient's circulatory status, and is difficult to obtain. Assessment of the skin is a better indication of the pediatric patient's circulatory status and it is important to use appropriately sized equipment when assessing a pediatric patient's vital signs. To obtain to auscultate blood pressure reading, use a cuff that covers two-thirds of the pediatric's upper arm. Cuff that is too small will give a falsely high reading. Cuff that is too large will give falsely low readings. The formula 70 plus 2 times the child's age in years equals the systolic blood pressure is a useful tool to determine blood pressure in children 1 to 10 years of age. Respiratory rates may be difficult to interpret. Count the respiratory respirations for at least 30 seconds, then double that number if counted for 30 seconds. In infants and children younger than 3 years, evaluate respirations by assessing the rise and fall of the abdomen. Assess the pulse rate by counting at least one minute, noting quality and regularity. Normal vital signs in pediatric patients vary with age. Assess respirations and then the pulse. Assess blood pressure last. Warm, stethic warm stethoscope before placing it on skin. Evaluate pupils using a small pen light. Compare the size of the pupils against each other. A pulse oximeter is a valuable tool to measure the oxygen saturation in a pediatric patient with respiratory issues. Reassess, reassess the pe pediatric patient's condition as necessary. Obtain vital signs every 15 minutes for a child in stable condition. Obtain vital signs every 5 minutes for a child in unstable condition. Continually monitor respiratory effort, skin color, and condition, and level of consciousness or interactiveness. Repeat the primary assessment and adjust your treatment accordingly. Interventions. Patients or caregivers may be able to assist. Able to calm and reassure child, often will well versed on their child's medical conditions, oxygen or nebulizer administration, communication and documentation. Communicate and document all relevant information to the ED personnel. Respiratory emergencies and management. Respiratory emergencies. Respiratory problems are the leading cause of cardiopulmonary arrest in pediatric population. Failure to recognize and treat declining respiratory status will lead to death. During respiratory distress, the pediatric patient is working harder to breathe and will eventually go into respiratory failure if left untreated. In the early signs of respiratory distress, you may not note changes in the pediatric patient's behavior, such as combativeness, restlessness, and anxiety. Signs and symptoms increase of increased work of breathing. Nasal flaring, abdominal breath sounds, accessory muscle use, and the tripod position. As the pediatric patient progresses to possible respiratory failure, efforts to breathe decrease. The chest rises less with inspiration. The body has used up all its available energy stores and cannot continue to support the extra work of breathing. Without care, cyanosis may develop. Changes in behavior will occur until the pediatric patient demonstrates an altered level of consciousness. Patient may also experience periods of apnea. As a lack of oxygen becomes more serious, the heart muscles become hypoxic and slow down. Leads to bradycardia, almost always an ominous sign of pediatric patients. If the heart rate is slow, you must begin CPR immediately. May quickly progress to cardiopulmonary arrest. Respiratory failure does not always indicate airway obstruction. It may indicate trauma, nervous system problems, dehydration, or metabolic disturbances. A pediatric patient's condition can progress from respiratory stress to respiratory failure at any time. You must reassess the pa pediatric patient frequently. 
A child or infant in respiratory distress needs supplemental oxygen. For infants and children, it is possible respiratory failure. Assist ventilation with a BVM and 100% oxygen. Allow the pediatric patient to remain in a comfortable position, usually on the lap of a caregiver or parent. Airway obstruction. Children can obstruct their airway with any object that can fit into their mouth. In cases of trauma, teeth may, be, may have been dislodged into the airway. Blood, vomitus, and other secretions can also cause mild to severe airway obstruction. Infections including pneumonia, coop, epiglottitis, and bacterial tractitis can also cause airway obstructions. Infection should be considered if patient has congestion, fever, drooling, and cold system symptoms. Croup is an infection in the airway below the level of vocal cords. Epiglottitis is an infection of the soft tissue in the area above the vocal cords. The figure shows the effort effects of epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is an infection that can cause airway obstruction in pediatric patients. Obstruction by a foreign object may involve the upper or lower airway. Obstruction may be partial or complete. Signs and symptoms frequently associated with a partial upper airway obstruction include decreased or absent breath sounds and stridor. Stridor is usually caused by the swelling of the area surrounding the vocal cords or upper airway obstruction. Infants or children with a complete airway obstruction will not make any sounds, will have no breath sounds, and will become rapidly cyanotic. Signs and symptoms of global airway obstruction include wheezing and or crackles. The best way to auscultate breast sounds in a pediatric patient is to listen on both sides of the chest at the level of the armpit. Immediately begin treatment for a pediatric patient with an airway obstruction. If the patient is conscious and coughing forcefully and someone saw him or her Ingest a foreign object. Encourage the child to cough to clear the airway. If this does not remove the object, do not intervene, except to provide supplemental oxygen. Allow the patient to remain in whatever position is most comfortable and monitor his or her condition. If you see signs of severe airway obstruction, attempt to clear the airway immediately. Ineffective cough, no sound, inability to speak or cry, increasingly respiratory difficulty with stridor, cyanosis, and loss of consciousness. If an infant is conscious with a complete airway obstruction, perform up to five back blows followed by chest thrusts. Position the infant face down on your forearm, supporting the jaw and head with your hand, and slap the back forcefully five times with the heel of your other hand. If the airway does not clear, flip the child onto his or her back and perform five chest thrusts in the same man manner you would for CPR. Repeat the process until the obstruction clears or until the infant becomes unconscious. If the child is conscious with a complete airway obstruction, perform abdominal thrusts, the Heimlich maneuver. Continue until the obstruction is relieved or until the child loses consciousness. Use the head tilt, chin lift, and finger sweep to remove a visible foreign body in an unconscious pediatric patient. Chest compressions are recommended to re re relieve a severe airway obstruction in an unconscious pediatric patient. Increases pressure in the chest, creating an artificial cough that may force a foreign body from the airway. Asthma, a condition in which the smaller air passages, the bronchioles, become inflamed, swell, and produce excessive mucus, which leads to difficulty breathing. A true emergency if not promptly identified and treated. According to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, 10% of children in the United States have asthma, and in 2007 alone, 185 children died from asthma. Common causes for an asthma attack include upper respiratory infection, exercises, exposure to cold air or smoke, and emotional dis stress. Signs and symptoms of asthma. Char characteristic wheezing as patient attempts to exhale through partially obstructed lower airway passages. 
In other cases, the airways are completely blocked and no air movement is heard. Cyanosis and respiratory arrest may quickly develop. Tripod position allows for easier breathing. Treatment of a pediatric patient with asthma. If possible, let the pediatric patient assume a position of comfort in the par parent's lap. Administer supplemental oxygen via route that is toler tolerated by the child. A bronchial dilator via a metered dose inhaler with a saucer mask device may be administered based on local protocols. Often, the parents or caregivers have attempted multiple doses of ibuterol. In this case, meet ALS providers en route for advanced care. If you must assist ventilations, use slow, gentle breaths. Resist the temptation to squeeze the reservoir bag hard and fast. A prolonged, unrelieved asthma attack may progress into status as mitis, a true emergency. Administer oxygen and provide rapid transport to the ED. If patient becomes so exhausted, he or she stops struggling to breathe. The patient is not recovering and is likely to stop breathing. Manage airway aggressively. Administer oxygen and transport promptly. ALS should be considered. Pneumonia. According to the World Health Organization, ammonia is the leading cause of death for over 2 million children worldwide annually. Pneumonia is a general term that refers to an infection of the lungs. Often a secondary infection, it occurs after a pre-existing infection such as a cold. It can also occur from chemical ingestion or direct lung injury or submersion incident. Children with diseases causing immunodeficiencies are at an increased risk for developing pneumonia. Incidences are greater, greatest during fall and winter months. Presentation in a pediatric patient. Unusual rapid breathing, or will breathe with grunting, grunting or wheezing sounds, nostril flaring, tachypnea, hypothermia or fever, unilateral diminished breath sounds, or crackles over the infected lung, lung segments. Treatment of pneumonia in a pediatric patient. Tr primary treatment will be supportive. Monitor the patient's airway and breathing status. Administer supplemental oxygen if required. If the child is wheezing, administer a bronchodilator if permitted in your EMS system. Diagnosis of pneumonia must be confirmed in the hospital. Croup. Croup or laryngeotracheal bronchitis is an infection of the airway below the level of the vocal cords usually caused by a virus, typically seen in children between ages 6 months and 3 years, easily passed between children. The disease starts with a cold, cough, and low-grade fever that develops over two days. The hallmark signs of croup are strider and a seal bark cough. Croup often responds well to the administration of humidified oxygen. Bronchial dilators are not indicated for croup and can make the child worse. Epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is an infection of the soft tissue in the area above the vocal cords. Bacterial infection is the most common cause. Since the development of a vaccine against one organism that causes epiglottitis, the insistence of this disease has dramatically decreased. In preschool children and school age children, especially, the epiglottitis, epiglottis can swell to two to three times its normal size. Children with this infection look ill, report a very sore throat, and have high, a high fever. They will often be found in the tripod position and drooling. Bronchiolitis, specific viral illness of newborns and toddlers often caused by respiratory synthyl virus, RSV, causes inflammation of the bronchioles. RSV is a highly contagious and spreads through coughing and, or sneezing. Virus can survive on surfaces. Virus tends to spread rapidly through schools and child care centers. More common in premature infants and results in copious secretions that may require suctioning. Occurs during 
the first two years of life and is more common in males, most widespread in the winter and early spring. Bronchioles become inflamed, swell, and fuel with mucus. Airways of infants and young children can easily become blocked. Look for signs of dehydration, shortness of breath, and fever. Treatment of bronchiolitis in a pediatric patient. Display a calm demeanor when approaching. Allow the patient to remain in a position of comfort. Treat airway and breathing problems as appropriate. Humidified oxygen is helpful if available. Consider ALS backup. Pertussis. Pertussis, also known as whooping cough, is a communicable disease caused by a bacterium that is spread through respiratory droplets. As a result of vaccines, this potentially deadly disease is less common in the United States. The typical signs and symptoms are similar to the common cold, coughing, sneezing, and a runny nose. As the disease progresses, the coughing becomes more severe and is characterized by a distinctive whoop sound heard during inspiration. Infants infected with pertussis may develop pneumonia or respiratory failure. To treat pediatric patients, keep the airway patent, open, and transport. Pertussis is contagious, so follow standard precautions, including wearing a mask and eye protection. Airway adjuncts, devices that help maintain the airway or assist in providing artificial ventilation, including oral pharyngeal, nasal pharyngeal airways, bite blocks, and BVMs. Oral pharyngeal airway, designed to keep the tongue from blocking the airway, makes suctioning easier, and should be used for pediatric patients who are unconscious and in possible respiratory failure should not be used in conscious patients, those who have a gag reflex, or who may have ingested a caustic or petroleum-based product. See Skill Drill 34-2. Neosinpharyngeal airway, usually well tolerated and not as likely to cause vomiting. Use for responsive pediatric patients. Used in auscultation for hospital association with possible respiratory failure. Rarely used in infants younger than one year. Should not be used in pediatric patients with a nasal obstruction or head trauma. See Skill Drill 34-3. Potential problems. An airway with a small diameter may easily become obstructed by mucus, blood, vomitus, or soft tissues of the pharynx. The airway, if the airway is too long, it may simulate the vagus nerve and slow the heart rate, or enter the epiglottis causing gastric distension. It may cause a spasm of the larynx and result in vomiting if inserted into a responsive patient. N nasal pharyngeal airways should not be used when pediatric patients have facial trauma because the airway may tear soft tissues and cause bleeding into the airway. Oxygen delivery devices. In treating infants and children who acquire more than the usual 21% oxygen found in room air, you have several options. Blow by technique at six liters per minute provides more than 21% oxygen concentration. Nasal cannula at one to six liters provides 24 to 40% oxygen concentration. Non rebreather mask at 10 to 15 liters provides 95% oxygen concentration, and BVM with oxygen reservoir at 10 to 15 liters per provides nearly 100% oxygen concentration. Use of a non-rebreather mask, nasal cannula, or simple face mask is indicated only for pediatric patients who have adequate respirations and or tidal volumes. Children with respirations of fewer than 12 breaths per minute or more than 60 breaths per an altered level of consciousness or an inadequate tidal bottom should receive assisted ventilations with a BVM. Blow-by method. The blow-by method is not nearly as effective as a face mask or nasal cannula for delivering oxygen. Does not provide high concentration of oxygen, but is better than no oxygen. Administer blow-by oxygen, placing oxygen tubing through a small hole in the bottom of an 8-ounce cup. Connect the tubing to the oxygen source set to 6 liters a minute. Hold the cup approximately 1 to 2 inches away from the child's nose and mouth.
blow-by method. The blow-by method is not nearly as effective as a face mask or nasal cannula for delivering oxygen. It does not provide high concentration of oxygen, but is better than no oxygen. Administer blow-by oxygen. Place oxygen tubing through a small hole in the bottom of an 8-ounce cup. Connect the tubing to an oxygen source set for 6 liters a minute. Hold the cup approximately 1 to 2 inches away from the child's nose and mouth. Nasal cannula. Some pa pediatric patients prefer the nasal cannula. Others find it uncomfortable. Applying a nasal cannula. Choose the appropriately sized pediatric nasal cannula. The prong should not fill the nares entirely. Connect the tubing to oxygen source set at 1 to 6 liters per minute. The figure on this slide shows the blow-by technique and a nasal cannula. Non-rebreather mask delivers up to 90% oxygen to the pediatric patient and allows them to exhale all carbon dioxide without rebreathing it. Applying a non-rebreather mask, select the appropriate size pediatric non-rebreather mask. The mask should extend from the bridge of the nose to the cleft of the chin. Connect the tubing to an oxygen source set it to 10 to 15 liters a minute. Adjust oxygen flow as needed to match the respiratory rate and depth. Bag valve mask. Indicated for pediatric patients who have respirations that are either too slow or too fast, who are unresponsive or who do not respond to purposeful way to painful stimuli. Assisting ventilations with a BVM. Ensure that you have an appropriate equipment in the right size. Mask should extend from the bridge of the nose to the cleft of the chin. Maintain a good seal on the mask on the face. Ventilate at appropriate rate volume using slow, gentle squeeze. Stop squeezing and begin to release the bag as soon as the chest wall begins to rise, indicating that the lungs are filled to capacity. One person BVM ventilations on a pediatric patient. See Skill Drill 34-4 to perform one-person BVM ventilation. The figure on this slide shows a pediatric patient, non-rebreather mask, and one-person BVM ventilation. Two-person BVM ventilation on a pediatric patient. This procedure is similar to one-person BVM ventilation, except that one rescuer holds the mask to the patient's face and maintains the head position and the other ventilates, usually more effective in maintaining a tight seal as it provides an open airway due to pr proper body position. Cardiopulmonary arrest. Cardiac arrest in infants and children is most often associated with respiratory failure and arrest. Children are affected differently than adults when it comes to decreasing oxygen concentration. Adults become hypoxic and the heart develops a dysrhythmia that leads to sudden cardiac death. This is often in the form of ventricular fibrillation. AED is a treatment of choice. Children become hypoxic and their hearts slow down, becoming more bradycardic. The heart will beat slower and more weakly until no pulse is felt. The overall survival rate from cardiac arrest in the pre-hospital setting is about 8%. Pre-hospital survival rate from respiratory arrest is over 70%. A child who is breathing very poorly with a slowing heart rate must be ventilated with high concentrations of oxygen early to try to oxygenate the heart before cardiac arrest occurs. Circulation Emergencies and Management Shock Shock is a condition that develops when the circulatory system is unable to deliver a significant amount of blood to the organs of the body, results in organ failure and eventually cardiopulmonary arrest. Compensated shock is the early stages of shock when the body can still compensate for blood loss. Decompensation shock is a later stage of shock when the blood, blood pressure is falling. In pediatric patients, the most common causes of shock include traumatic injury with blood loss, especially abdominal, dehydration from diarrhea or vomiting, severe infection, neurological injury, such as severe head trauma, a severe allergic reaction, anaphylaxis to an allergen, insect bite or food allergy, diseases of the heart, collapsed rung, tension pneumothorax, blood or fluid around the heart, cardiac tamponade, or peritonitis, 
pericarditis. Pediatric patients respond differently than adults to fluid loss. They may respond by increasing their heart rate, increasing respirations, and showing signs of pale or blue skin. Signs of shock in children are as follows. Tachycardia, poor capillary refill, two second, less than two, greater than two seconds. Mental status changes. Begin treating shock by assessing the ABCs, intervening as required. If there is an obvious life-threatening external hemorrhage, the order becomes CAB because bleeding control is the most critical step. If cardiac arrest is suspected, the order becomes CAB because chest compressions are essential. Pediatric patients in shock often have increased respirations but do not de demonstrate a fall in blood pressure until shock is severe. In assessing circulation, pay attention to the following. Pulse. Assess rate and quality of pulses. A weak, thready pulse is a sign of a problem. Anything over 160 beats per minute suggests shock. Skin signs. Assess temperature and moisture of hands and feet. Capillary refill. A two-second capillary refill time is normal. Color. Assess skin color changes... Changes in pulse rate, color, skin sign, and capillary refill time are all important clues suggesting shock. Blood pressure is the most difficult sign to measure in pediatric patients. Blood pressure may be normal with compensated shock. Low blood pressure is a sign of decompensated shock requiring ALS and rapid transport. Assessment should also include take, talking with the parents or caregivers to determine when signs and symptoms first appeared and whether any of the following occurred. Decreased urine output, absence of tears, sunken frontinelles, changes in levels of content, consciousness and behavior. Limit your management of these simple interventions. Do not waste time performing field procedures. Ensure the airway is open and prepare for artificial ventilation. Control breathing. Give supplemental oxygen by mask or blow-by method. Continue to monitor airway and breathing. Position the pediatric patient in a position of comfort. Keep warm with blankets and by turning up the heat in the patient compartment. Provide immediate transport. Contact ALS backup as needed. Anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis, also called anaphylactic shock, is a life-threatening allergic reaction that involves a generalized multi-system response to an antigen, characterized by airway swelling and dilation of blood vessels. Common causes are insect stings, medications, or food. Signs and symptoms of anaphylactic shock in a pediatric patient. Hypoperfusion, strider and or wheezing, increased work of breathing, altered appearance, restlessness, agitation, and sometimes a sense of impending doom. Hives are usually present. Treatment of a pediatric patient with anaphylactic shock. Maintain the airway and administer oxygen via a tolerated route. In stable patients, allow the parent or caregiver to assist in the positioning of the patient, oxygen delivery, and keeping the patient calm. Based on protocols, assist with epinephrine auto-injector if available. Pediatric epinephrine auto-injector is supplied in a dose of 0.15 milligrams and is given intramuscularly in the lateral thigh. Provide rapid transport. Bleeding disorders. Hemophilia is a congenital condition in which the patient lacks one or more of the normal clotting factors of the blood. Most forms are hereditary and are severe. Predominantly found in the male population, bleeding may occur spontaneously. All injuries become serious because blood does not clot. Transport immediately. Do not delay to apply a tourniquet for life-threatening hemorrhage. Neurologic emergencies and management. Altered mental status. AMS. AMS is an abnormal neurologic state in which the pediatric patient is less alert and interactive than is age appropriate. Understanding normal developmental and age-related changes in behavior and listening carefully to the caregiver's opinion are key. A pediatric patient not behaving in a developmental appropriate manner 
could indicate an altered mental status. The mnemonic A-E-I-O-U-T-I-P-P-S reflects the major causes of AMS. Signs and symptoms vary from simple confusion to coma. Management focuses on the ABCs in transport. If the level of consciousness is low, the pediatric patient may not be able to protect his or her airway. Ensure a patent airway and adequate breathing through a non-rebreather mask or BVM. Transport to the hospital. Seizures. A seizure is a result of disorganized electrical activity in the brain. Common causes, child abuse, electrolyte imbalance, fever, hypoglycemia, infection, ingestion, lack of oxygen, medications, poisoning, seizure disorder, recreational drug use, head trauma, no cause can be found, may manifest in a very variety of ways, depending on the age of the child. Seizures in infants can be very subtle, consisting only of an abnormal gaze, sucking motions, or bicycling motions. In older children, seizures are more obvious and typically consist of repetitive muscle contractions and unresponsiveness. Once a seizure stops, the patient's muscles relax, becoming more flaccid or floppy, and the breath, breath becomes labored. This is a postactal state. The longer and more intense the seizure are, the longer it will take for this imbalance to correct itself. Once the pediatric patient regains a normal level of consciousness, the postactal state is over. Seizures that continue every few minutes without regaining consciousness in between or last longer than 30 minutes are referred to as status, status epileptus. Recurring or prolonged such seizures should be considered potentially life-threatening. If the patient does not regain consciousness or continues to seize, protect the patient from harming himself or herself and call for ALS backup. These patients need advanced airway management and medication to stop the seizure. Management. Securing and protecting the airway are your priorities. Position the head to open the airway. Clear the mouth with suction. Consider placing the pediatric patient in the recovery position if he or she is vomiting and suction is inadequate. Provide 100% oxygen by non-rebreather mask or blow-by method. Begin BVM ventilations if there is no sign of improvement. Some caregivers will have given the child a rectal dose of diazepam prior to arrival. Monitor breathing and level of consciousness carefully. Transport to an appropriate facility. Meningitis. Inflammation of tissue meningenes that covers the spinal cord and brain. Caused by an infection by bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. If left untreated, it can lead to brain damage. Being able to recognize a pediatric patient with meningitis is an important skill to have. Indi some individuals are at greater risk. Males, newborn infants, children with compromised immune system from AIDS or cancer, children who have a history of brain, spinal cord, or back surgery, children who have had head trauma, children with shunts, pins, or other foreign bodies within their brain or spinal cord, especially children with ventricle pulmonial VP shunts. Signs and symptoms of meningitis vary depending on the age of the patient. Fever, altered level of consciousness are common signs of, in all ages. Changes in the level of consciousness can range from a mild or severe headache to confusion, lethargy, and or an inability to understand commands or interact appropriately. Children may also experience a seizure, which may be the first sign of meningitis. Infants younger than two to three months can have a pina, cyanosis, fever, and a distinct high-pitched cry or hypothermia. Meringeal infection or meringeal signs are terms used by the doctor to describe pain that accompanies movement. Often results in characteristic stiff neck. One sign of meningitis in an infant is an increasing inability and irritability and bulging frontenelle without crying. 
Narsa menditis is a bacterium that causes rapid onset of meningitis symptoms, often leading to shock and death. Children with N. meningitis typically have small pinpoint cherry red spots or a large purple black rash on face or body. These children are at serious risk for septic shock and death. The figure on this slide shows Nassaria meningitis. Children with Nassaria meningitis typically have small pinpoint cherry red spots or a large purple black rash. All pediatric patients with suspected meningitis should be considered contagious. Follow standard precautions when dealing with pediatric patients with possible meningitis and follow up to learn the patient's diagnosis. If exposed to saliva or respiratory secretions, you should rece receive antibiotics. Treat the child with suspected meningitis. Provide with supplemental oxygen and assist with ventilations if needed. Reassess vital signs frequently during transport to the highest level of service available. Gastrointestinal emergencies and management. Never take a com complaint of abdominal pain lightly because a large amount of bleeding may occur within the abdominal cavity without any outward signs of shock. Monitor the first signs and symptoms of shock, including an altered mental status, pale cool skin, tachypnea, tachycardia, and bradycardia. Complaints of gastrointestinal origin are common in pediatric patients, maybe from ingestion of certain foods or unknown symptoms. In most cases, the pediatric patient will experience abdominal discomfort with nausea, vomiting, and or diarrhea. Vomiting and diarrhea can cause dehydration. Appendicitis is also common. If untreated, can lead to peritonitis or shock. Peritonitis is the inflammation of the peritoneum, which lines the abdominal cavity, with typically present then with a fever and pain on palpation of the right lower abdomen, abdominal quadrant. Rebound tenderness is a common sign associated with appendicitis. If you expect appendicitis, promptly transport to the hospital for further evaluation. Obtain a thorough history from the primary caregiver in particular, ask questions such as, how many wet diapers does a child have today? Is your child tolerating liquids? And is he or she able to keep them down? How many times has your child had diarrhea and for how long? When he or she cries, are tears present? Poisoning emergencies and management. Poisoning is common among children, can occur by ingesting, inhaling, injecting, or absorbing a toxic substance. Common sources of poisoning in children are alcohol, aspirin, acetaminophen, cosmetics, household cleaning products such as bleach or furniture polish, house plants, iron, prescription medications, illicit drugs, vitamins. Signs and symptoms of poisoning vary widely depending on the substance and age and weight of the child. The patient may appear normal at first or may be confused, sleepy, or unconscious. Some substances only take one pill to be lethal in a small child. Be alert for signs of abuse. After you have completed your primary assistant assessment, ask the parent or caregiver the following questions. What is the substance or substances involved? Approximately how much of the substance was ingested or involved in the exposure? What time did the incident occur? Are there any changes in behavior or level of consciousness? Was there any choking or coughing after the exposure? Contact poison control for assistance in identifying poisons. Treatment of a poisoned pediatric patient. First perform an external decontamination. Remove tablets or fragments from the patient's mouth. Wash or brush poison from the skin. Assess and maintain ABCs and monitor breathing. Provide oxygen and perform ventilations if necessary. If the child decom demonstrates signs of shock, position supplying, keep the child warm, and transport properly. In some cases, give activated charcoal according to medical control or local protocol. Not indicated for patients who have 
ingested an acid or an alkali or a petroleum pro product. Not recommended for pediatric patients who have a decreased level of consciousness and cannot protect their own airway or are unable to swallow. Some common trade names for suspension form are Instachar, Actidose, and Liquid Char. The usual dose for a child is one gram of activated charcoal per kilogram of body weight. Pediatric dose is 12.5 to 25 grams. Dehydration emergencies and management. Dehydration occurs when fluid losses are greater than fluid intake. Vomiting and diarrhea are the most common causes of dehydration. If left untreated, dehydration can lead to shock and death. Infants and children are at greater risk than adults for dehydration because their fluid reserves are smaller than those in adults. Life-threatening dehydration can overcome an infant in a matter of hours. Dehydration can be mild, moderate, or severe. Signs of mild dehydration. Dry lips and gums, decreased saliva, few wet diapers, signs of moderate dehydration, sunken eyes, sleepiness, irritability, loose skin, sunken frontinelles, signs of severe dehydration, molted, cool, clammy skin, delayed capillary response time, increased respirations. Treating dehydration in the pediatric patient. Assess ABCs, obtain a baseline vital signs. If dehydration is severe, ALS backup may be necessary for IV access. Transport to the ED if signs are moderate to severe. Fever emergencies and management. Simply defined as a fever is an increase in body temperature, usually in response to an infection. Temperatures of 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius or higher are considered abnormal. Fever is rarely life-threatening, but fever with a rash can be a sign of a serious condition such as meningitis. Common causes of fever in pediatric patients include infection, status epileptus, cancer, drug ingestion, aspirin. Arthritis, symptoms, uh, systematic lung and the thermos rash across the nose, high environmental temperature, fever is a result of an internal body mechanism in which heat generation is increased and heat loss is decreased. An accurate body temperature is an important vital sign for pediatric patients. A rectal temperature is the most accurate for infants to toddlers. Older children will be able to follow directions by placing the thermometer under the tongue or arm. Depending on the source of infection, the pediatric patient may present with signs of respiratory distress, shock, a stiff neck, a rash, skin that is hot to the touch, flushed cheeks, seizures, and an infant's bulging frontinelles. Access the patient for other signs and symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, decreased feelings, and headache. Provide rapid transport and manage the patient's ABCs. Follow standard percussion precautions if you suspect the patient may have a communicable disease. Febrile seizures. Febrile seizures are common in children between ages of six months to six years. Most pediatric seizures are the result of fever alone, which is why they are called febrile seizures typically occur on the first day of a febrile illness, characterized by generalized tonic-clonic seizure activity, lasts fewer than 15 minutes with little or no postictal state, may be a sign of more serious problems such as meningitis. Assess ABCs, provide cooling measures with tepid water, and provide prompt transport. All patients with febrile seizures need to be seen in a hospital setting. Drowning emergencies and management. In drowning emergencies, you must always take steps to ensure your own safety. Drowning is the second most common cause of unintentional death among children aged one to four years in the United States. Children often fall into swimming pools and lakes 
but many drown in bathtubs and even puddles or buckets of water. Older adolescents drown when swimming or boating. Alcohol is frequently a factor. Principal condition that results from drowning is lack of oxygen. Even a few minutes without oxygen affects the heart, lungs, and brain. Causes life-threatening problems such as cardiac arrest, respiratory failure, and coma. Submersion in icy water can lead to hypothermia. Most people in this situation die. Diving into water increases the chance, risk of neck and spinal cord injuries. Signs and symptoms will vary based on type and length of submersion. A pediatric patient may present with coughing, choking, airway obstruction, difficulty breathing, AMS, seizure activity, unresponsiveness, fast, slow, or no pulse, pale cyanotic skin, and abdominal distension. Management of a drowning emergency. Assess the ABCs, contact ALS crew to intervene if needed, administer 100% oxygen via non-rebreather mask, or BVM if assisted ventilations are required. Be prepared to suction as these patients often vomit. If trauma is suspected, apply a cervical collar and place the patient on a long board. Pad all open spaces under the pediatric patient before securing the patient onto the board. Perform CPR on the unresponsive patient and cardiopulmonary arrest. Pediatric Trauma Emergencies and Management Un Intentional injuries are the number one killer of children in the United States. Quality of cares in the first few minutes after a child has been injured can have an enormous impact on that child's chances for a complete recovery. The muscles and bones of children continue to grow well into adolescence. For this reason, coupled with the risk-taking approach to activities, adolescents are prone to fractures of the extremities. A fracture of the femur is rare in a pediatric patient, but will when it does occur, it is a source of major blood loss. Older children and adolescents are prone to long bone fractures, femur and humerus, because they tend to take more risks during physical activities. Physical differences. Children are smaller than adults, and therefore the location of their injuries may differ from that of an adult for the same type of crash. Children's bones and soft tissues are less well-developed than those of an adult, and therefore the force of an injury affects these structures differently. Because of a child's head is proportionally larger than an adult's, it exerts greater stress on the neck and structures during a deceleration injury. Psychologic differences. Children are often injured because of their undeveloped judgment and their lack of experience. Always assume the child has a serious head or neck injury. Injury patterns. It is important for the EMT to understand the special physical and psychologic characteristics of children and what makes them more likely to have certain kinds of injuries. Vehicle collisions. Children playing or riding a bike can dart out in front of motor vehicles without looking. The area of greatest injury varies depending on the size of the child and the height of the bumper at the time of impact. Children involved in these types of injuries typically sustain high energy injuries to the head, spine, abdomen, pelvis, or legs. Sport activities. Children, especially those who are older or adolescents, are often injured in organized sports activities. Head and neck injuries can occur after high speed collisions in a contact sport such as football, wrestling, ice hockey, field hockey, soccer, or lacrosse. Remember to immobilize the cervical spine when caring for children with sport-related injuries. Be familiar with your local protocols for helmet removal. Injuries to a specific body systems. Head injuries. Head injuries are common in children because of the size of the child's head in relation to the body is larger than that of an adult. An infant has a softer, thinner skull, which may result in the injury to the brain tissue. The scalp and facial vessels can bleed very easily and may cause a great deal of blood loss if not controlled. Nausea and vomiting are common signs and symptoms of a head injury in children. Easy to mistake for an abdominal injury or illness. You should suspect a serious head injury of any child who experiences nausea or vomiting after a traumatic event. Immobilization. Spinal mobilization is necessary for all children who have possible head or spine injuries after a traumatic event. See Skill Drill 34-5.
Immobilization can be difficult be the of the child's proportions. Young children require padding under the torso to maintain a neutral position. See skill drill 34-6 for steps to immobilize pediatric patient in a car seat. About at around eight of to ten years of age, children no longer require padding underneath the torso. They can line supine on the blackboard. Padding will be required along the sides of a child so the child can properly secure to an adult sized backboard. Chest injuries. Usually the result of blunt rather than penetrating trauma. Chest wall flexibility in children can produce a flail chest. Keep this in mind as you assess a child who has sustained high-energy blunt trauma to the chest. Even though there may be no external sign of injury, there may be injuries within the chest. Pediatric patients are managed in the same manner as adults. Abdominal injuries. Abdominal injuries are common in children. Children can compensate for significant blood loss better than adults without signs and symptoms of shock developing. Children can have a serious injury without early external evidence of problems. All children with abdominal injuries should be monitored for signs and symptoms of shock, including a weak rapid pulse, cold clammy skin, decreased capillary refill, confusion, and decreased systolic blood pressure. If the patient so shows signs and symptoms of shock, prevent hypothermia by keeping the patient warm with blankets. If the patient has bradycardia, ventilate and monitor during transport. The figure on this slide illustrates the impact of blood loss on the potential for developing shock. All children with abnormal abdominal injuries should be monitored closely for signs and symptoms of shock. Burns. Burns to children are generally considered more serious than burns to adults. Infants and children have more surface area relative to total body mass, which means greater fluid and heat loss. Children also do not tolerate burns as well as adults do. Children are also more likely to go into shock, develop hypothermia, and experience airway problems. The most common ways in children are burned are exposure to hot substances such as scalding water in the bathtub, hot items on the stove, exposure to caustic substances such as cleaning solvents or paint thinners. Older children are more likely to be burned by flames from fire. You should expect possible internal injuries when you see a child with burns around the mouth and face. Infection is a common problem following a burn injury in children. Burn skin cannot resist infection, effectively as normal skin can. Sterile techniques should be used in handling the skin of children with burn wounds if possible. You should consider the possibility of child abuse in any, child abuse in any burn situation. Make sure you report any information and, and suspicions to the appropriate authorities. Severe, severity of burns. Minor, partial thickness burns involve less than 10% of the body surface. Moderate, partial thickness burns involving 10% to 20% of the body surfaces. Severe, any full thickness burn, a partial thickness burn involving more than 20% of the body surface or any burn involving the hands, feet, face, airway, or genitalia. Pediatric patients are managed in the same manner as adults. If the patient shows signs and symptoms of shock, prevent hypothermia by keeping him, warm, him or her warm with blankets. If the patient has bradycardia, ventilate. Monitor, and monitor the patient during transport. Injuries of the extremities. Children have immature bones with active growth centers. Growth of long bones occurs at the ends at a specialized growth plate. Growth plates are potentially weak spots. Incomplete or green stick fractures can occur. Generally, extremity injuries in children are managed in the same manner as those in an adult. Painful, deformed limbs with evidence of broken bones should be splinted. Specialized splinting equipment should only be used if it fits the pediatric patient. You should not attempt to use adult immobilization devices on a pediatric patient unless the pediatric patient is large enough to properly fit. Pain management. The first step in pain management is recognizing that the patient is in pain. Some, since some 
pediatric patients will be nonverbal or have a limited vocabulary, look for visual clues and use the Wong Baker Faces Pain Scale. You are limited to the following pain interventions. Positioning, ice packs, extremity elevation. These, these interventions, interventions will decrease the pain and swelling to the injury site. Additional ALS interventions may be needed. Another important tool is kindness and providing emotional support. Disaster management. The Jumpstart triage system was developed for pediatric patients, intended for patients younger than age eight years and weighing less than 100 pounds. There are four triage categories in the Jumpstart system, designated by colors corresponding to different levels of urgency. Decision points include able to walk except in infants, green tag minor not in need of immediate transport, presence of spontaneous breathing with peripheral pulse and a appropriately responsive to painful stimuli. Yellow tag is delayed treatment. Apnea responsive to positioning or rescue breathing, respiratory failure breathing but without a pulse or inadequate painful response. Red tag immediate response. Apneic and without a pulse or apneic and unresponsive to rescue breathing. Black tag considered deceased or expectic deceased. The figure on this illustration slide shows the illustration of the Jumpstart triage system. Child abuse and neglect. Child abuse means any improper or excessive action that injures or otherwise harms a child or infant. Includes physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, or emotional abuse. Over half a million children are victims of child abuse annually. Many of these children suffer life-threatening injuries and some die. If suspected child abuse is not reported, the abuse is likely to happen again, perhaps causing permanent injury or even death. You must be aware of signs of child abuse and neglect. It is your responsibility to report to law enforcement or child protection agencies. Signs of abuse. As an EMT, you will be called to homes because of reported injury to a child. Child abuse occurs in, in every society economic status, so you must be aware of the parent, patient's surroundings and document your findings objectively. You may be called to testify in abuse cases. It is essential to report all findings, including any statements made by caregivers or others on the scene. Ask yourself the following questions. Is the injury typical for the developmental level of the child? Is the MOI reported consistent with the injury? Is the parent or caregiver behaving appropriately? Is there evidence of drinking or drug use at the scene? Was there a delay in seeking, child, in seeking care for the child? Is there a good relationship between the caregiver and the child? Does the child have multiple injuries at different stages of healing? Does the child have any unusual marks or bruises that may have been caused by cigarettes, grids, or branding injuries? Does the child have several types of injuries? Does the child have any burns on the hands or feet that involve a glove distri distribution? Is there any unexplained decreased level of consciousness? Is the child clean and appropriate weight for his or her age? Is there any rectal rectal or vaginal bleeding? What does the home look like? Clean or dirty? Is it warm or cold? Is there food? The mnemonic child abuse may help you remember the points to look for. Bruises. Observe the color and location of any bruises. New bruises are pink or red. Over time, bruises turn blue, then green, then yellow-brown and fade. Note the location of bruises. Bruises to the back, buttocks, or face are suspicious and are usually inflicted by a person. Burns. Burns to the penis, testicle, vagina, or buttocks are usually inflicted by someone else. Burns that encircle a hand or foot or look like a glove are usually inflicted by someone else. You should suspect abuse if the child has cigarette burns or a grid pattern burn. 
fractures. Fractures of the humerus or femur do not normally occur without major trauma. Falls from a bed are not usually associated with fractures. You should maintain some index of suspicion if an infant or young child sustains a femur fracture. A complete fracture of the bone in a pediatric patient indicates that the child was exposed to a great deal of traumatic force. Shaken baby syndrome. Infants may sustain life-threatening head trauma by shake, being shaken or struck in the head. This life-threatening condition is called shaken baby syndrome. There is bleeding within the head and damage to the cervical spine as a result of intentional forceful shaking. The infant will be found unconscious, often without evidence of external trauma. The infant may appear to be in cardiopulmonary arrest. Shaking tears blood vessels in the brain, resulting in bleeding around the brain. The pressure from the blood results in increased cranial pressure, leading to coma and death. Neglect. Neglect is refusal or failure on the part of a caregiver to provide life necessities. Examples are water, clothing, shelter, personal hygiene, medicine, comfort, and personal safety. Children who are neglected are often dirty, too thin, or appear developmentally delayed because of the lack of stimulation. You may observe such children when you are making calls for unrelated problems. Report all suspected cases of neglect. Symptoms and other indicators of abuse. Abused children may appear withdrawn, fearful, or hostile. You should be concerned if a child does not want to discuss how an injury occurred. Occasionally, the parent or caregiver will reveal a history of accidents, be alert for conflicting stories, or lack of concern from the caregiver. The abuser may be a parent, caregiver, relative, or friend of the family. EMTs in all states must report suspected abuse. Most states have special forms to do so. Supervisors are generally forbidden to interfere with reporting of suspected abuse. Law enforcement and child protection services will determine whether there is an abuse. It is not your job to prove that there is abuse. Sexual abuse. Children of any age and of either gender can be victims of sexual abuse. Maintain an index suspicion regarding, regardless of the patient's social or economic situation. This type of abuse is often the result of long-standing abuse by relatives. Assessment should be limited to determining the type of dressing any injuries require. Treat any bruises or fractures as well. Do not examine the genitalia of a young child unless there is evidence of bleeding or is there is any injury that must be treated. Do not allow the child to wash, urinate, or defecate before the physician completes a physical exam. Difficult step, but important to preserve evidence. Ensure that an EMT or police officer of the same gender remains with the child unless locating one will delay transport. Maintain professional composure the entire time. Assume a concerned, caring approach. Shield the child from onlookers and curious bystanders. Obtain as much information as possible from the child and any witnesses. Child may be hysterical or unwilling to say anything. You are the be in the best position to obtain the most accurate first-hand information. Record any information carefully and completely on the patient care report. Transport all children who are victims of sexual assault. Sexual abuse is a crime. Cooperate with law enforcement officials in their investigations. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome The death of an infant or young child is called Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, SIDS when after a complete autopsy, the death remains unexplained. About 3,500 infants die of SID annually. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that a baby be placed on his or her back on a firm mattress in a crib that is free of bumpers, blankets, and toys. The CDC recommends having a baby sleep in the same room, but not in the same bed, chair, or sofa as an adult. Although it is impossible to predict SIDS, risk factors include mother younger than age 20 years, mother smoked during pregnancy, low birth weight, death as a result of SIDS can occur at any time of day. You will face, you will face with three tasks, assessment of the scene, assessment and management of the patient, and communication and support of the family. Patient assessment and management. An infant who has been a victim of SIDS will be pale or blue, not breathing, and unresponsive. 
Other causes for such a condition include the following. Overwhelming infection, child abuse, airway obstruction from a foreign object, or result of infection, meningitis. Accidental or intentional poisoning, hypoglycemia, low blood glucose level, congenital metabolic defects. Begin with the assessment of the ABCs. Provide interventions as necessary. Depending on how much time has passed, the patient may show signs of post-mortem changes including stiffening of the body, called rigor mortis, dependent lividity, which is the pooling of blood in the lower parts of the body, or those that are in contact with the floor or bed. If the child shows these signs, call medical control. In some EMS system, systems, a victim of SIDS may be declared dead on the scene. Deciding whether to start CPR on the child with rigor mortis or dependent lividity can be very difficult. Family members may consider anything less to be withholding critical care. The best situation may be, begin to, may be to begin CPR and transport the child and the family to the nearest ED. If there is no signs of postmortem changes, begin CPR immediately. As you assess the patient, pay special attention to any marks or bruises on the child before performing any procedures. Note any intervention that you that was done before your revival. Scene assessment. Carefully inspect the environment, noting the condition of the scene where the infant was found. Your assessment of the scene should be concentrated on the following. Signs of illness, including medications, humidifiers, or thermometers, the general condition of the house, signs of poor hygiene, family interaction. Do not allow yourself to be judgmental about family interactions at this time. Do, not re no, do note and report any behavior that is clearly not within the acceptable reins, such as physical or verbal abuse. The site where the infant was discovered. Note all items in the infant's crib or bed, including all pillows, stuffed animals, toys, and small objects. Communication and support of the family after the death of a child. The sudden death of an infant is a devastating event for a family. It also tends to invoke strong emotional responses among health caregivers. Part of your job at this point is to allow the family to express their grief. In addition to any medical treatment the child may require, you must be prepared to offer the family a high level of empathy and understanding. The family may want you to initiate resuscitation efforts, which may or may not conflict with your EMS protocols. Always introduce yourself to the child's parents or caregivers and ask about the child's date of birth and medical history. Do not, in any case, speculate on the cause of the child's death. The family will want to see the child and should be asked whether they want to hold the child and say goodbye. The following interventions are helpful in caring for the family at this time. Learn and use the child's name rather than the impersonal your child. Speak to family members at eye level and maintain good eye contact with them. Use the word dead or died while informing the family of the child's death. Emphasis, emphasis such as passed away or gone are ineffective. Acknowledge the family's feelings. I know this is devastating for you, but never say I know how you feel. Even if you have experienced a similar event, the statement will anger many people. Offer to call other family members or clergy if the family wishes. Keep any instructions short, simple, and basic. Emotional distress may limit their ability to process information. Ask each adult family member individually whether he or she wants to hold the child. Wrap the dead child in a blanket as you would if he or she was alive. Stay with the family members while they hold the child. Ask them not to remove tubes or any other equipment that was used in an attempt to resuscitation. Each individual and each culture expresses grief in a different way. Some will require intervention. Most caregivers feel directly responsible for the death of a child. This does not mean they are actually responsible. Although you should keep the possibility of neglect or abuse in mind, your role is not of the investigator. Further inquiry is the responsibility of law enforcement. Some EMS systems arrange for home visits after a child's death so that EMS providers and family members can come to some sort of closure. You need special training for such visits. A child's death can be very stressful. Take time before going back to the job. Talk to other EMS colleagues. Be alert for signs of post-traumatic stress in yourself and others. 
nightmares, restlessness, difficulty sleeping, lack of appetite. Consider the need for professional help if these signs occur. Apparent life-threatening event. Infants who are not breathing and are cyanotic and unresponsive when found sometimes resume breathing and color with stimulation. These childs have what's called as an apparent life-threatening event, A-L-T-E, called a near-miss SIDS in the past. A classes, classic A-L-T-E is characterized by a distinct change in muscle tone, choking, or gagging. After the event, the child may appear healthy and show no signs of illness or distress. You must complete a careful assessment and provide rapid transport to the ED. Pay strict attention to airway management. Assess the infant's history and environment. Allow the caregivers to ride in the back of the ambulance. Physicians will have to determine the cause. Okay, class. Let's go over some review questions. Review question one. How does the pediatric anatomy differ from the adult anatomy? A. The trachea is more rigid. B. The tongue is proportionately smaller. C. The epiglottis is less floppy. D. The head is proportionately larger. The correct answer is D. There are several important anatomic differences between the pediatric patients and the adult patients. The head is significantly, the opet is proportionately larger. Their tongue and epiglottis are also proportionately larger, and the epiglottis is floppier and more omega shaped. The child's airway is narrower at all levels, and the trachea is less rigid and easily collapsible. Answer A. A pediatric trachea is less rigid, narrower, and more uh, anterior than an adult's trachea. B. A tongue is proportionately larger than the adult's tongue. C. The epiglottis is floppier and shaped differently. D is the correct answer. Review question 2. When a small qu child falls from a significant height, the blank most often strikes the ground first. A. Head. B. Back. C. Feet. D. Side. The correct answer is A. Compared to adults, pediatric patients have proportionally larger heads. When they fall from a significant height, gravity usually takes them head first. This is why head trauma is most common cause of traumatic death in pediatric patients. A is the correct answer. B. The head is heavier and gravity tilts the head, tends to tilt the head into the downward direction. Answer C, adults will attempt to land, their, land feet first. D, the head is heavier and gravity tends to tilt the head in a downward direction. Review question three. When assessing a conscious and alert nine-year-old child, you should A, isolate the child from his or her parent, B. Allow the child to answer your questions. C. Obtain all your information from the parent. D. Avoid placing yourself below the child's eye level. The correct answer is B. A nine-year-old child is capable of answering questions. By allowing a child to answer your questions, you can gain his or her trust and build a good rapport, which felicitates further assessment and treatment. Do not isolate the child from his or her parent, yet do not allow the parent to do all the talking unless the child is unable to communicate. When assessing any patient, you should place yourself at, at or slightly below the patient's eye level. This position is less intimidating and helps to maintain, minimize the patient's anxiety. A. Do not isolate a child from his or her parents. B is the correct answer. C. Some information from the parents is useful, but allow the child to speak. D. Never tower over a child. Instead, maintain yourself at or below eye level. Review question four. The purpose of a shunt is to A. Minimize pressure within the skull. B. Reroute blood away from the lungs. C. Instill food directly into the stomach. D. Drain excess fluid from the peritoneum. The correct answer is B. A. A ventricle parishional VP shunt, simply called a shunt, is a tube that extends from the ventricles cavities of the brain to the 
peritoneal cavity. The VB shunt shunts are used to drain excess fluid from the brain, thus preventing increased pressure within the skull. A is the correct answer. B, the shunt is connected from the brain to the abdomen. C, the shunt drains excess cerebral spinal fluid from the brain. D, the shunt drains excess cerebral spinal fluid from the brain. Review question five. Which of the following statements regarding febrile seizures is correct? A, febrile seizures usually indicate a serious underlying condition such as meningitis. B, most febrile seizures occur in children between the ages of two months and two years of age. C, febrile seizures are rarely associated with tonic clonic activity, but last for more than 15 minutes. D, freeball seizures usually last less than 15 minutes and often do not have a postictal phase. The correct answer is D, freeball seizures are the most common seizures in the pediatric patients. They are common between the ages of six months to six years of age. Most patients' seizures are due to fever alone, hence the name freobile seizures. However, seizures and fever may indicate a serious more, a more serious underlying condition, such as meningitis. Freebrile seizures are characterized by generalized tonic-clonic activity and last less than 15 minutes. If a postictal phase occurs, it is generally very short. A. Most febrile seizures are caused by fever, but a fever and seizures may be an indication of a serious underlying condition. B. Most febrile seizures occur between ages of six months to six years. C. Febrile seizures last less than 15 minutes. D is the correct answer. Review question six. You respond to a sick child late at night. The child appears very ill with a high fever and is drooling. He is sitting in the tripod position, struggling to breathe. You should suspect A, croup, B, pneumonia, C, epiglottitis, D, severe asthma. The correct answer is C. The child has all the classic signs of epiglottitis, high fever, drooling, and severe respiratory distress. Epiglottitis is a potentially life-threatening bacterial infection that causes the epiglottis to swell rapidly and potentially obstruct the airway. A. This is a viral disease characterized by edema of the upper air airways and a barking cough and strider. B. This is the inflammation of the lungs caused by bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other organisms. C is the correct answer. D. This is a lower airway condition resulting in intermittent wheezing and excess mucus production. Review question 7. Treatment for a semi-conscious child who swallowed an unknown quantity of pills includes A. Administering 1 gram per kilogram of activated charcoal and rapidly transporting B. Monitoring the child for vomiting, administering oxygen and transporting C. Positioning the child on his left side, elevating his legs 6 inches and transporting D. Contract medical control and requesting permission to induce vomiting. The correct answer is B. If a semi or unconscious child has ingested pills, poisons, or any other type of harmful substance closely observed for vomiting, give high flow oxygen, assist with ventilations if necessary, and rapidly transport to the emergency department. Do not give activated charcoal to any patient who is not conscious and alert enough to swallow. Indication of vomiting is not indicated for anyone regardless of age. Answer A, do not give anything by mouth to an individual who is not conscious and alert enough to swallow. Answer B is the correct answer. C, placing the child in the recovery position is acceptable if vomiting is possible, but the patient's legs should remain flat. D, inducing vomiting is not indicated for anyone at any age. Review question eight. When using the mnemonic child abuse to assess a child for signs of abuse, you should recall that the D stands for A, delay in seeking care, B, divorced parents, C, dirty appearance, D, disorganized speech. The correct answer is A, 
The mnemonic child abuse stands for consistency of injury with the child's development age, history inconsistent with the injury, inappropriate parental concerns, lack of supervision, delay in seeking care, effect, bruises of varying stages, unusual injury patterns, suspicious circumstances, and environmental clues. A delay in care may happen when the patient or caregiver does not want to, the abuse to be noted by other people. A is the correct answer. B, divorce may put the child at greater risk, but does not indicate the child is being abused. C, this is something providers should be aware of. A potential for abuse exists, but this does not indicate that the child is being abused. D, this may indicate a learning disability or handicap. Review question nine. A four-year-old girl fell from a second-story balcony and landed on her head. She is unresponsive, has slow, irregular breathing, has a large hematoma to the top of her head, and is bleeding from her nose. You should A. Immediately perform a full-body scan to detect other injuries, administer high-flow oxygen, and transport at once. B. Apply a pediatric-sized cervical collar, administer high-flow oxygen via pediatric non-rebreather mask, and prepare for immediate transport. C. Manually stabilize her head, open her airway with a jaw thrust maneuver, insert an airway adjunct, and begin assisting her ventilations with a bag valve mask. Suction her airway for up to 10 seconds, insert a narrow pharyngeal airway, apply a pediatric sized cervical collar, and emergency administer oxygen via a pediatric non rebreather mask. The correct answer is C. This child has a severe head injury and is not breathing adequately. You must manually stabilize her head to protect her spine. Open her airway with a jaw thrust maneuver, suction her airway if needed, insert an oral pharyngeal airway, and assist her ventilations with a bag valve mask. The full body scan is performed after you have performed a primary assessment to detect any correct and correct any life threats. The narrow pharyngeal airway is contraindicated for this child. She has a head injury and is bleeding from her nose. A, a full body scan is performed after the primary assessment. B, assisted ventilations must be started on the patient with slow irregular respirations. C is the correct answer. D, a nasopharyngeal airway is counterindicated with potential facial injuries. Ventilations need to be maintained with a bag valve mask. Review question 10. The AVPU scale is used to monitor a patient's level of consciousness. What does the P stand for? A. Pallor. B. Pediatric. C. Painful. Or D. Pale. The correct answer is C. The P in the AVPU scale stands for painful. If the patient is responsive to pain, they should withdraw from it. A. Pallor means that the skin is pale. This has nothing to do with the level of consciousness. B. The same AVPU scale is used for adults and pediatrics. C is the correct answer. D. The patient's positioning may provide clues to the patient's condition, but it is not part of the AVPU scale. Okay, class. This concludes the lecture on Chapter 34, Pediatrics. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact your instructor, and I'll see you in the next chapter.